Okay, so we're at Oshkosh with uh, Vans Aircraft President Ryan Johnson. Uh, obviously last year Vans turned up with the RV15, uh, made a big splash. This year it's back uh, and we're keen to find out what's been going on with developments. Uh, Ryan, great to see you, great to see the aeroplane. Uh, what have you been up to? Well, a lot of changes that you just can't tell from the outside. But a lot of uh, good work that we've been doing on the control system mainly. So. Uh, new ailerons, ailerons that we've uh, changed the shape of, the trailing edge shape as well as the hinge point, and it flies like an RV. We've, we've achieved our goal. Controls were a little bit heavy, but we knew we could reduce that force. Uh, the other thing is initially the stabilator was a bit light, and uh, we've, we've harmonized those both things together. The initial stabilator had a, uh, a split configuration where there was a trim tab on one side, and an anti-servo tab on the other. When we've linked those two together, um, we're still in a version, final version of the control mechanism that will run that, but aerodynamically, we have what is working, and uh, it's working great. So overall, this flies like an RV. Of course, it's a longer wingspan, more inertia to the airplane, so you have to use your feet a little bit. Yep. There's a little bit of adverse yaw, but you can still fly around with your feet on the floor. Uh, I flew my RV7 to work, and then flew this right afterwards and 85 knots to that, uh, you know, 100 plus knot range flew beautifully, just like the RV, uh, just like the RV7. So there's been a few changes as well. Starting at the, the front of the airplane, we had some issues with uh, the addition. We have quite a bit of power on this airplane. The uh, IO390 EXP119 has 220 plus horsepower the way we have it configured. And um, when you would add that power as quickly as possible in the go-around situation, we had some pitch concerns with uh, you know, a pilot with lower skill being able to overcome that. Yeah. And so we've angled the, the nose of the engine down. Uh, we're sweeping the wing back and sweeping the A-pillar back. And when you first look at it, you may think it's coming into your sight of view, but it, it works out perfectly. It's actually easier to lean forward and look around that A-pillar now. But the real advantage we knew that we wanted to add more baggage capacity for the lightweight engines, and we really didn't feel we had a marketable product. So now is the time to shift that wing back four inches. And structurally, it lines things better. We think we can get some weight out of the airplane. It's Oshkosh. <laughs> but we're looking for that 180 horsepower to 220 horsepower range. Uh, for engines. So, so that'll start with the um, the parallel valve IO360. So 180 horse up to the IO390. Correct. Yes, that that exact engine range. So, we'll retain uh, the large baggage area that we have. You know, uh, we have a, a baggage door that that works great. The strut's actually going to sweep forward slightly from where it is now, and we're accepting the fact that it's going to raise the loads on the wings just a little bit. Uh, we want to be able to open that main door and let you put things easily in and out of the main cockpit with the seat slid all the way forward. Uh, we're in the final version of the airplane inside the computer. We haven't cut parts for that yet, um, so we're just refining the, the final version of the airplane. But as for this version, the aerodynamics, we solved the aerodynamics. One thing uh, that we learned early on was that up where your legs are, now that we have an A-pillar, we've never had to deal with that before. The airplane, I brought it in a little bit tight. So we've done two things. We've reduced the stick travel side to side, and we're widening the airplane two whole inches at that point. So it makes a world of difference uh, how people fit and interface with the airplane. Uh, the flap system, currently you'll see tufts on the back of the airplane. And uh, we had some separation, actually lost lift areas on the flap because the flap tracks are too wide. We're going to be moving the outboard flap tracks uh, to the ends of the flap and then narrowing the flap tracks themselves. Uh, they were conservatively designed and we just wanted to get in the air before. Um, the only number we're not telling you is the stall speed. And I know Axel's had a 140 foot landing and around 200 foot takeoff uh, in this airplane with the, the 390 engine. So. The airplane's flying beautifully from that regard. Uh, we're still aiming at a 900 pound useful load. We're seeing speeds in the 130s right now at the 6x6 tires. We hope to get over 140 with 
wheel pants, and once we've cleaned things up, I mean, this airplane has a lot of aerodynamic deficiencies right now. So, um, uh, one ahead. one thing I was thinking of is last year there was some speculation: is it going to be two seats, four seats? I think that's been fixed. Right. So you've you've kind of decided where it, that's going to be. Right. All along, we knew you could you could have two smaller people, children in the back, yeah. but there really isn't headroom for four seats. And as we know, there's a lot of airplanes that call themselves four-seaters, and they're not really four-seat airplanes. And in our belief, if you're going to go to four seats, you need a six-cylinder engine, you need 260 horsepower, you need what we have in the RV-10 to have a real four-seater. And in the applications where you might be in the mountains, we didn't want somebody to load four full-size people in here and expect to have baggage. You take a Cessna 180, you can't have four people in full fuel, let alone baggage. And we know people will treat this airplane uh, you know, beyond probably where we have the limits. We don't want them to, but that's the reality. So limiting it to two seats, we have a two seat configuration here, which I think will have a long life. Uh, if we do a four seat in the future, yeah. it'll be done properly with the right amount of power. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so possibly RV16, bigger RV15, six cylinder <laughs> engine, maybe. Um, and uh, so I guess timelines, um, when are you thinking that uh, there possibly might be a kit? Possibly a kit, uh, at least by Oshkosh next year. So uh, the, the problem is this airplane is so easy to build, uh, especially in the pop rivet configuration. The wings and the tail are very close in the computer and we're working through refinements on the fuselage. If I put out the tail kit, people would be building them you know, within days, weeks, and saying, where's my wing kit? Then I had the wing kit out, and then it would be some time until we get the fuselage kit out because we want to get that right. We're still deciding, you know, what do we want to do for the builder in the fuselage kit? Mosaic is underway right now, and so that's determining at what level we'd have a quick build kit or what levels we're doing things for the builder. And uh, it's likely we'll, we'll be building part of the A-pillar at least for you, at minimum, but uh, that's gonna have large bearing on, on how we design that fuselage kit. So. Uh, we don't want people waiting for the fuselage kit for an extended period of time, and we want all the kits closer to being finished by the time we uh, we sell the first kit. Fantastic. And I think, uh, just going back to the wings, uh, fuel's going up in the wings? It is, and we uh, from last year we went from 50 to 60 gallons. Um, a couple of reasons. Uh, first, people to go into the bush, they want that extra capacity, and as long as they respect the gross weight. Second, last year we spent a whole day over at the float pane float plane base and uh, we learned right away that you know when you're filling up a float plane you might not get as much fuel as you, you think in there and so to add some extra margin for the float plane and speaking of that we've moved the fuel cap pretty far inboard we don't have much dihedral on this airplane um, and that that fuel cap can come in inboard so you could stand here right on the main tire the inboard part of the strut and easily fuel the the airplane in the float plane application fantastic with bags or with bags in the bush. Yeah. Uh, well, fantastic, Ryan. Uh, it's very exciting to see it again. Exciting to hear about uh, everything that's going on with it, uh, and we look forward to uh, to seeing it uh, hopefully next year, maybe. Okay. I think from here we'll turn it over to Axel, and he can tell you it's easiest tail dragger to fly in the fleet. These gear are amazing, and and uh, yeah, get some interviews here with Axel on, on how it flies. Okay, so we're with Axel Alvarez. Axel's the uh, test pilot at Vans and has flown the RV-15 the most. Axel, fantastic to see the aeroplane here. Um, obviously, you've got the most hours on the RV-15. I am the how, person. How has it changed from first flight to where, we're, where, you're, where you're at now? The, uh, the biggest changes are in control forces, uh, some of the handling. So at the beginning, our control forces for pitch and the rudder were really light, uh, similar to what you would expect in an aerobatic aircraft. This being more of a utility type aircraft, we wanted it to be uh, stable, a little bit more feedback on the controls. So we went through a series of flight tests to increase those forces. Uh, having a flying tail, that makes it uh, complicated to get that, that feeling just right, the RV feeling right, right? So we're looking for that RV feeling. Everything harmonized light forces but yet stable so we went through a series of changes on the tail to increase the forces and increase the stability of the aircraft the whole airframe the rudder was also really light in uh, in forces so when i would put my foot just rest my foot on the pedal uh, that would be enough to get the ball 
going the wrong direction. So we knew we needed to work on that. We went through a series of changes there, and we actually removed the counterbalance altogether to get the forces closer to each other. So now the, the aircraft as it sits, the forces are what we would call the RV feeling. Everything harmonized, everything close to each other, where there's not a lot of deviation between roll and pitch uh, based on speed. And it's stable, yet a very maneuverable aircraft compared to where it started. Okay, and, uh, and during testing, I mean, what, sort of, uh, you know, what sort of things did the aeroplane try and teach you? It, it, did it with any, any, any moments where it caught you unawares? So the, the unaware moments were the how light the forces were. So uh, the, the first takeoff, we didn't just take off. We went through, we picked up the tail, and we already knew that it was going to be light forces. So we started mitigating some of those things from the beginning. We added gurney flaps. That was a big deal at the first show, right? Everybody was looking at it and like, what is this? What's going on here? So uh, just to increase the forces, the feedback to the pilot. Uh, and, and I think that the test team, all of us did not expect that it would take a long time to get the forces right, uh, but that was a complex thing that uh, maybe out of everything, maybe that's the one thing that we underestimated because we spent a lot of time on that to try to get it just right. And, uh, and Ryan, before the, before the video started, shared with me that uh, he said everyone's had a botch landing in this, even even um, even Axel. What, what did you learn from that? So that that is a... That is a really, really good uh, topic to speak about. So botch landing, right? So we all as pilots have a landing that's not perfect, right? Uh, whether we want to admit it or not, right? So the, the thing with this aircraft, the way the landing gear is designed, the way that the, the aircraft behaves, if you make a bad landing, instead of power and trying to get all this stuff done, what we do is we literally bad landing, grab the stick, this hand, grab the stick, hand on here on the throttle, and you just pin it back, and you just wait. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and the energy dissipates until no energy, and then it lands. So a normal landing, uh, what I usually do is I set the attitude, I pick where I'm going to land, pull the power, and I just stall it on top of the runway, and it's just done flying. And then no brakes, you just taxi on out. Right? So uh, the, the difference there is if it's a bad landing, just hold it, keep what you got, don't do anything crazy, just hold it and it'll settle down on its own. Fantastic. And I guess my last question to you, are you going to build one? Do you like it? Absolutely. Uh, I am building one. It'll be building two, right? So this one, a couple of us built. My wife is really interested in this. She's ready for it. Uh, I keep telling her she's going to have to wait, just like everybody else. But we will build one and uh, it will be our own. So we're looking forward to, uh, we, you know, we designed the door so we get a dog in and out of it. Uh, so we're looking forward to put our dog in and out of it. We're looking forward to go put it on floats and go do that. So we're, we're really excited about it. So we want our own. And uh, it's nice to have the factory one, but we definitely want our own. <laughs> Axel, thanks very much, and uh, best of luck with uh, with uh, everything that uh, goes on to get you to uh, Oshkosh next year with the with the conforming prototype. Yeah. So that next year, that the hope is that all these stickers that you see over the airplane, they're done, and you see something that you would be able to purchase yourself. Fantastic. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> see you. Okay, so uh, at Air Venture Oshkosh with uh, Ryan Johnson, Chief Tech. Uh